you could, if you could please turn in your Bible to Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew 22. What I've learned for from years over the Lord uh, about the Lord is that when He pur purposes on your heart to preach or to teach on the Sunday, you do what He says, and you trust that there's going to be fruit from it. And I pray that it be this would be a blessing to every hearer here. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, help us, as the psalmist said, not to forget any of Your benefits. Help us neither to forget forget any of Your blessings in our life and of all the riches that are promises and things that are for us in Christ Jesus. Not only temporary promises as we walk this earth and are in this land, but also of eternal promises that our life is hidden with Christ in God. Jesus, we're here today because we love you, and I pray that you would get all the glory. Father, I pray you lift up your son here, and if anyone doesn't know Christ as their Savior, that today would be the day of salvation. In Jesus' name I pray, amen about our Lord Jesus Christ, often he faced some who tried to catch him in some statement that he made. And then others, there were others who would falsely accuse him at times. And then there were still others who would test our Lord. And one day, a lawyer someone known to be a technician in the law of Moses, he stood before Jesus and he wanted his question answered from the Lord. And either that man was trying to ensnare Jesus or maybe he tried to defame our Lord on some theological grounds or maybe the lawyer was trying to test Jesus about his knowledge of the law of Moses that he had written, by the way. Or maybe that lawyer just wanted Jesus teaching on a much disputed point at the time of what was the most important commandment from, from God for us to keep. Now, we need to remember about motives and how the Word of God says that Jesus Christ will one day expose the motives of the heart of every person. But Jesus takes the time and he answers this lawyer's question. Matthew chapter 22, verse 35 to 40. One of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him. Teacher, what is the great commandment in the law. And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So Jesus answered his question. He told him of what the weightiest and greatest commandment was. And now I want to say this, he quoted certainly from the Old Testament, from the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, and where most Jews at the time would even repeat something from Deuteronomy, that which was called the Shema, they would repeat it twice a day to themselves. But mostly the Jews wouldn't practice it. Mostly they wouldn't do it. Or mostly they wouldn't apply it into their lives. Like what a man named Walter Marshall said about loving God and us loving God. He said how that God is not really loved in the way that He should be. That God is not really loved in the way that He ought to be. Deuteronomy 6.5 And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul 
and with all your strength. And it's not only for us to say that we love God, because that's good, or not to only say it in word, but also to show it in deed, in actions towards God. Now, God gave the Israelites the Ten Commandments. And when someone doesn't keep them, it's called a sin. The sinning against God. He given the Ten Commandments from the Law of Moses for us to keep them. And the Law of Moses is this, first and foremost, the first commandment. First, that you shall have no other gods before me. Exodus 20. So it's for us not to want any substitutes in our life other than God. It's against polytheism. It's, a, it's against people worshiping multiple gods at once. Many false gods. And many times doing that because of superstition. God should have first place in our life. The living God. The God of Israel. The great I Am. Jesus Christ. The great shepherd of our souls. Should have first place and priority in our lives. I wonder though if all the phone, cell phone towers were down at once. What would happen and what would you do? I wonder if all the cable companies uh, at the same time lost their signal. What would you do? How would you spend your time? Would it be with God? Then in Exodus 20 in the Ten Commandments it says that thou shalt not make idols, paintings, things you bow down to, things you serve other than Christ. Then it says that you shall not take the Lord's name in vain. What does that mean? It can have a few different meanings, I believe. Don't take the, the Lord's name in vain. It seems pretty typical in our world today, but we're not to do that as believers. It means to not do any unnecessary or vain swearing and making a promise and using God's name to do so. It's also, I really believe, not to misuse or to be irreverent when it comes to us using the name of God. And then it says that you shall keep the Sabbath. I think it pertains today, to today also. That we should make sure to have a day of rest. And it's also where it's a day to worship God. A day to focus on the Lord again. Someone said... Recently to me, they said about, well, if all the waves of the people of the church would be in church, all together the church might be full. Some come one week and some come another week and some come another week. And if all those people came at once, the house of the Lord could be full. So it's a day, having a day to focus on the Lord God again. I ask you, what gets your first attention in your life? And is your... Is it your time with God that matters mostly to you? So in these first commandments, it shows us some ways to love God, not to use His name in vain, to have a day of rest, to not have idols, to not have any other gods before our God. But then the next commandments are about our relationship with other people, how we should treat other people. And first, and the first one in that is how that you shall honor your father and mother, that it's important to do that. To obey them, to do what they say. It's important for our society today, for our homes today, and for the children today to hear that. And then it says that you shall not kill. It, it speaks to how that God is against murder, whether it be in the womb or any other kind of murder, that God is against it. And then it says how that you shall not commit adultery which is about not invading another person's household with committing adultery. And it also speaks to not breaking the marriage bond. Not breaking the marriage covenant for no reason. Not any reason at all. The Ten Commandments also say that thou shalt not steal. And you look at that and you realize it's about, it's against any kind of fraud happening. And also against robbery. It's also against taking something that is not yours or it could be also about respecting other people's property. Then it says, you shall not lie, whether it's public or private, to bear false witness against someone else. Like in a court of law, speaking against them, that something that's not true, something that would damage someone else. And then it says that thou shalt not covet. 
or not to desire or lust sinfully after something that belongs to someone else, anything that belongs to someone else. So in these last commandments, it tells us the way to treat our neighbor, to love them that way. The Ten Commandments, in them Moses wanted the Israelites to obey God. And in doing them, in some small way, that they would demonstrate the character of God. In some small way, they would and could demonstrate God's divine character. And I really believe the only way that we can love God is for us to understand how much that He loves us. That's the only way we really can come to love God is to understand first and foremost, that He loves us. I think about how also that a way that we can love God, it says right there in the Scripture in Matthew 22, is that we can love God by caring for and loving other people. And in Jesus' parable of the Good Samaritan, it says of the Good Samaritan, it shows us how in Luke 10 that He was merciful and compassionate that he was willing to minister and care for someone else cross-culturally, somebody that was different than him. And again, he shows compassion to someone who had been beaten and robbed and hurt and was on the side of the road where other people just walked on by. He stopped and he helped the person. And as Christians today, we can become jaded and it's to be aware of becoming complacent about other people during times that they're having difficulties just to look the other way and keep on going and do nothing. But in the Good Samaritan, the parable that Jesus said, it, talks, it shows us how to love our neighbor, to be a good neighbor, to be willing to help, to treat others the way that you would want to be treated or like to be treated. Would you like to be laying on the side of the road and everybody just walk on by? Nobody caring about you, nobody helping you, nobody taking the time? So we're, we're, we're to treat one another the way that we would want to be treated. I see in the Good Samaritan how that he had a kind heart. I also see that he was willing to take action and that he not only cared for the wounds of the one who had been robbed and beaten, he not only took him to a place to be taken care of, but he had even paid for the injured man's way, made a way for him. It would have been good enough just to pick him up and take him someplace. But he not, he not only did that, he did something much more than that. He went the extra mile. He made a way for him. He paid a way for him. And what a picture of God's grace. And what a picture of how that Jesus Christ paid our sin debt for us. And we can learn from our Lord. And not, not to just keep going, but to see others' needs. And for us to intervene and to love our neighbor as ourselves. Now to love God is important. And we love Him because He first loved us. And He is really the only one, I believe, that's able to turn our heart's affection towards loving Him. Has He done that? Have you grown in your love for God? Are you growing in your love for Jesus Christ? God's love for us has not been passive. It's truly been expressed when Jesus died on the cross with his substitutionary death for us. So God not only says, I love you, but he proved it. And God's love is an agape type love. It's extended to everyone. It's actually a love that is given and offered, agape love, regardless of the response from those that it's offered to. Agape love. And God's love is everlasting to believers in Christ. I love the verse in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 3. It says this, The Lord appeared to him long ago saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. This is my favorite part. Therefore, I have drawn you out with kindness. Came and found us. Saved us. His love is everlasting. I like what a song says also, how that God's, God's love has been so gracious that it asks the question, has He won your heart at last? Has He won your heart at last? You see, there has to be a reversal in someone's mind when it comes to them loving God. There has to be a reversal in someone's heart for them to love God. I went and visited uh, 
three nursing homes this week. Three. Some in town, some out of town. And I talked to more than, more than one person in each place. And I want to ask you this this morning. After coming back from places, have you made a true profession of faith in Christ? Have you made any at all? Would, there, would it be hard to convict you as a Christian in a court of law, in the Bible sense of the term? Is there fruit in your life of the Holy Spirit? Is there some evidence of found of you being a believer? Matthew Henry said this to the believer in Christ. How that us loving God, that we are those who have good cause to do so because of His grace, because of His love that's shown towards us. So let us, church, keep loving God and even run out and embrace the greatest commandment and know that because of the indwelling Holy Spirit that a believer in Jesus Christ, that we can keep the law, that we can keep the Ten Commandments, that we were able to keep them. And we do them for God's glory. And there are benefits in us doing that. Jesus said that if you love me, you'll do what I say. Jesus said if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And he says in verse 37, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. It, in a sense, it's to give all that is in us to loving the Lord. To know that there's probably going to be some things when you're trying to do that and for it to be sincere is that you're probably going to have to leave some empty things behind to do that. Just leave them in the wake of you wanting to love God. Like some worldly ambitions, they might have to go to the wayside. Like, or like having even some prideful ambitions. You might have to leave them on the wayside. It's to love God, again, with everything in us. I like the word exclusive. You see that in the Ten Commandments. Have no other gods before me. To be devoted to God, I like that too. No, and no matter the situation, for us to obey God and to avoid the temptations to do otherwise. Again, when we keep God's commandments, it's to our own benefit. Because when we're loving Christ and loving God, other things do have to go to the wayside. Empty things. Really worthless things. But there is the danger of someone having self-love over seeking God. There is the danger of someone having self-love over loving God. The Bible warns that in the end times there's going to be some things happening in our world. Earthquakes, wars, rumors of wars, famines, pestilence. But it also warns of something else that's sobering. That might be some, one of the hardest things for us to deal with. It describes the character of what most people will be like. Their hearts will be like. And it says, and Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 3.2, that there will be lovers of their own self instead of lovers of God. So we'll be facing that. Beware of being about self in the place of loving God, where he must have first place in everything. Instead of anything else other than the great I am in your life, gaining control of your mind. I ask you, what or who does your heart follow after in place of the Lord? Sometimes it could be a person in our life that has taken the place of God, that our heart follows after them instead of God. I ask you another question. How are, how are we different or how are you different than non-Christians in your life? How are you different? How are we different? We ought to be different. We're to love God more than any other things. H.A. H. A. Ironside said this, how that Jesus had found him weak and faint and alone and that Jesus had bound him with his bands of love and saved his lost and wandering soul. And now it's one thing, I just read this this week, and I tweaked it a little bit. I just thought, what a saying, what a, what a phrase. Book on evangelism. Says, and, and, it's, and now it's one thing to be lost or unsaved, but it's even worse to be lost with no one looking for you. Lost and unsaved with no one looking for you. 
Jesus Christ came to save sinners. He came looking for you and I. Again, it's bad enough to be lost and unsaved. And it's even worse to be lost and have no one looking for you. So I think about doing evangelism. I think about us reaching the lost. We know someone that's alone right now. That's often by themselves. We know that. But even lost and alone, you're important and valuable to Jesus Christ. He wants you to be saved from your sins. He doesn't want you to die in your sins. And I ask you again, believer, this morning, have you grown in your love for God over the decades, over the days, and over the minutes of your life? Have you grown even more in your love for Him, in your love for Jesus Christ? Is it growing today? It's a good thing you're in the church. And, and about the law of Moses, we need to understand why it was given in the first place. That the law of Moses was never a way for salvation to happen. Never a way for really anyone to go to heaven. But it's only like a mirror to show people of their need for God's grace. It's, it's only like a mirror to show people their need for a Savior. Why? Because we can't keep the law. It, it, the law of Moses is like a tutor. It's described in the Bible to point people, to teach people of their need for the Son of God. That's what it's there for. Because no one can keep the law perfectly like Jesus did. So put your faith in him this morning if you haven't already. Is yours a true profession of faith in Jesus? You know, I, I, I like to say this. We don't have to be the greatest theologian to say this. He died for me. I know he did. I am his. He is mine. Jesus is my Savior. He forgave my sins. I know if I were to die right now, roof fall in, whatever, I'm going to be with Christ. I'm going to be in heaven. I know that. It's simply saying that. If you have that testimony, share it with other people. God commands everyone to repent. In other words, to turn from sin. Now, in John chapter 3, the last example, a very religious man came to Jesus Christ at night. And he had a question to it. And he said to Jesus, basically, how can someone be born again and be born and go back into their mother's tomb, womb and be born again that way? And Jesus said, that which is flesh is flesh and that which is spirit is spirit. And he also said that if someone is not born again, that they cannot see, that they will not enter or go to heaven if you're not born again. Are you born again this morning? Have you trusted in Christ? Let me ask you one more thing. If, this, if all the... Again, the cell towers went down, cell phone towers. What would you do? Would you be totally lost? And then at the same time, if every cable company was disconnected and you had to find something to do, would you spend time with the Lord, worshiping Him, reading His Word and praying? Let me pray. Father, we thank You that You've given us the Helper. You promised to send Him from heaven, and You have. And He helps us to love You. He helps us to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. I thank you for the Holy Spirit that we're sealed unto, unto the day of redemption. Grow your church. Grow us in the grace and knowledge of Christ. Help us to speak of him. Help us to tell him we love him. And help us to do the things you want us to do in this world until we go home. In Jesus' name, amen. Number 85, we're going to sing it twice. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, O oh, my soul, rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you hear, may it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear.
one more time. I love you, Lord. I lift my voice to worship you, O oh, my soul. Rejoice. Take joy, my King, in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. I pray for your provision for the church, and I pray, God, that you would grow it, not only that you can grow us, and you can also make it alive to us, and also have baby Christians come in, and we trust this in the name of Jesus. We make disciples. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.